So I want to start a series uh, uh, today, the next three Sundays, called In the Footsteps of Jesus. And it's from Mark 14, verses 32 to 36. And we're going to talk about the, we're going to spend the, the, trace the last 20 hours of Jesus' life. And so if I could this morning, I would get a big plane, and we need a really big plane, and I would fly us all to Israel. Wouldn't that be fun? But since we can't do that, what we can do is we can look at Scripture and find out what does the Bible say about the last 20 hours of Jesus' life. And so um, we, we're, we, would, we would have gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, which he was the night before he was crucified. We would have seen where, where Jesus and his disciples went to pray and ultimately await his arrest. And we would have seen where they believed Jesus was on trial there and before the Jewish officials and the Roman officials, and we was condemned to death. We would also have been able to walk in the same path. I mean, that's the coolest thing is to walk where Jesus walked, right? And we would have seen uh, the, the Via Dolorosa, which was called the Way of Suffering, which was Jesus' path carrying the cross to ultimately the hill called Golgotha, where it's believed that Jesus was crucified next to two criminals. But we can't be there in person. But in this series, the next three weeks, we're going to follow Scripture and retrace Jesus' steps to the cross. We are going to find meaning in each moment. Because the, think about this, Jesus was having dinner with his disciples at the Last Supper at 6 p.m. that night, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon the next day, he had breathed his last. It all happened so quickly, but in every moment, we find purpose and we find meaning. So during this series, we're going to walk, we're going to, we're going to walk step by step through these last three locations, the garden this week, the trial next week, and the crucifixion on Easter Sunday. So I want to encourage you to be here for all three of those. And on each stop along the way in the Garden of Gethsemane, the trials, we're going to see three characteristics that Jesus displayed. So these characteristics that Jesus displayed are characteristics that God wants to develop in our lives, in you and me, so that we can grow, and not just grow, but grow up. I mean, you know, it's good to grow up spiritually so that we can go deeper with God and deeper in our faith because that's what we want to do. Anybody here not want to grow in your faith? No, we want to grow. We want to become more like Jesus. We want to grow up in our faith. We, we want to become more mature. So we look at Mark chapter 14. Read this real quick. It says, there was a place, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began, Jesus began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then he said to them, stay here and keep watch. There's a whole bunch of sermons right there, right? Stay here and keep watch. Verse 35, going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And then he cries out, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. At the Last Supper, Jesus, if we look at what happened before this, the Last Supper, Jesus had identified his betrayer. And now he has become deeply distressed and troubled. His soul is crushed with sorrow to the point of death. You ever been to that place? Jesus is feeling all the emotions, all the, because he's fully human and fully God. Jesus at this moment is feeling all the emotions. You ever been deeply distressed, deeply distraught? You ever had so much sorrow that you didn't know how you were going to make it? He's been where you are, where some of you are now, and where you have been. He's been there. But notice what happens is he, he knows what's coming. Verse 35, it says, he fell to the ground and said, if it is possible, you can do all things. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He knows what is about to happen. He knows he's about to die one of the cruelest deaths you could ever suffer being hung naked on a cross after being beaten. He knows what's coming, which is why he cries, Abba, Father. Abba is a term that is an intimate term. It's, it's what we call our dad. You know, it's like, like, our dad, like my, my youngest daughter, Abigail, right, who's going to be 30 next month. That's hard to believe. My youngest daughter is going to be 30. That's, that's weird to say, isn't it? Let me take a breath here. My youngest daughter, up until she was four years of age, used to call me father. Yeah, that's, that's Abigail. That's, that's, that's how he is. Because most kids, they learn, they say, da-da. No, Abby said, father. 
I mean, I would say, Abby, would you like to go into the store with, with that? Because we would take turns. I had four kids, and we'd take turns who went in the store. Abby, you want to go to the store with me? She goes, no, thank you, Father. <laughs> Jesus cried out, Abba, Daddy, Father. But notice the, it, it, the interesting thing is, for, for a lot of us, we're, we can identify with Jesus here. We cry out, God, Father, everything is possible. You take this cup from me, and we put a period there. That's how a lot of our prayers are, right? A lot of our prayers are, God, get me out of this situation, even though I'm the one that got me in this situation. But get me out of this situation, God. That's how a lot of our prayers are. God, get me out of this storm. Get me out of this trial. Do a miracle. Do all these things for me. But notice what Jesus does. He doesn't just say, let this cup pass for me. God, you can get me out of this situation. I know you can. But notice what he says. He says, yet not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. Jesus submitted his will to his Father. This leads us to the focus of today's message. This is the characteristic that Jesus exhibited in the garden and that he wants to develop in us, and that is submission. Submission. And we think of submission, we, it's usually in the bad term, right? We think of submission, we think of giving up. Or giving in, right? You all watch big time wrestling, right? We all know that's real. There's nothing fake about that. It's real. These people are, those guys are really wrestling each other. It's real. But we think of what happens at the end. They tap out, right? They give up. They submit. And that's what we think of. It's usually in a negative context, right? Submission is this. And, and unfortunately, in the church, we, we, we use a scripture where it says, wives, submit to your husbands. And we use that as a hammer to beat up on wives who are unsubmissive to their husbands, even though their husbands aren't treating them. Because if you read the rest of that verse, you know what the rest of that verse says? And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And guess what Jesus did? He submitted himself to his Father's will and loved the church so much that he gave his life for the church. So husbands, before you demand submission from your wives, you better be willing to give your life for her. And all the women said, amen. amen. Guys, we've got to quit using God's word to beat up our wives. It's a mutual submission, by the way. I'm submitting myself to my wife, and she's submitting herself to me, and together we're submitting ourselves to Jesus. Is it okay if I preach good, good theology today? But usually we, we talk about submission, it's in a negative context. But listen to this, in this context, submission is one of the most powerful and positive words you could think of. It's life-giving. Listen, submission is not life-altering, it's life changing it's it's life giving when when we when we put god's will above my will when i put god's will above my desires when i put god's will above my wishes i put god's will above my dreams and my life it's life giving it's life changing this is why the prayer of jesus in the garden of gethsemane is so important if we can learn what it means to live a life of submission to god then we can discover god's true purpose for our lives. So there's a few things that I'm going to go through real quick because I know you can't wait to see people get baptized and I can't wait either. I love Baptism Sunday. I love that my two favorite Sundays are Baptism Sunday and Baby Dedication Sunday. And we did that last week and one of those who dedicated their baby last week is getting baptized this Sunday. Isn't that exciting? So I'm excited. I'm excited. I, and I, they told me that the temperature is 82 degrees and the, so please pray for me as I get into the baptism today. Number one, remember the blessings of submitting to God's will in my past. Psalm 77, 11 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your miracles of long ago. Listen, there's power in memory. Here's how I know. Remember your first dog? Some of you smile. Your first friend. You know the friend that you, through thick and thin, you did everything with, and then when you got in trouble at school, he blamed you? You don't remember that part. You just remember, okay, what about, your, what about your first car? A lot of you guys are like, yeah, wish I still had that. It got 27 gallons to a mile. Right? My old, I had a 77 lipstick red Ford Thunderbird. Two, yeah, I know. Two door. 
And when you parked in a parking lot, you had to park, make sure no one parked next to you because when that door opened, buddy, it was opening up. Big front end, that baby was beautiful. Lipstick red, gray interior, got 25 gallons to a mile. I, I couldn't afford to drive it very often. But remember that. What about the birth of your child or grandchild? See, the memory is a powerful thing. Unfortunately, our human nature is that we tend to remember our short-term memory, remembers the, 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 the wrong things, we remember the, the failures, we remember all the, the things that we're not supposed to remember, which is why we're supposed to guard our minds, why we're supposed to take captive every thought. If you're having a hard time submitting in your relationships, you're having a hard time submitting to God about your finances, hard time submitting to God about your uh, time you spend, about your, you ready for this? Your phone usage, and by that I don't mean talking on the phone to people, that's a good thing. I'm talking about your social media addiction. If you're having a hard time submitting to God about your career, et cetera, remember this, God will never let you down if you submit to his will. God will never let you down if you submit to his will. So the the best thing to do is remember all the times we submitted to God in the past and that God came through. And that God doesn't always come through the way we want him to, but he always comes through. And I will tell you this, the way he comes through is always better than my plan. Remember the blessing of submitting God's will. Second, we recognize areas of my life where I need to submit to God's will. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offense in me. What are the areas of our lives that we need to submit to God? We need to self-reflect. We need to hold a mirror up to our lives. Now, some of us, as we get older, we don't like looking in the mirror because we see these bags under our eyes and more lines in our forehead and our hair starts running away, changing colors, going who knows where, right? Not talking about looking in the mirror physically. We need to reflect on our lives. We need to live a life where we're reflecting on what is God doing, what area of my life and, and begin to recognize those areas that we need to submit to God's will. What are those areas? Big decisions, anxiety. This leads us to the next point. We remember the blessings of submitting to God's will in the past, recognize the areas of my life where I need to submit to God's will, and then relinquish control. Oh boy. See, sometimes it's easy to self reflect. We, can know, we, we, we take inventory of life and we notice, oh man, I, I'm not doing so well in this area of my life. Sometimes that's the easy part. And then God says, relinquish it. Oh man. Wow. Okay, God, I know I need help in this area, but any control freaks in here? You didn't want to raise your hand. Didn't want to be known. Yeah, you know, like, like control. Uh, you got to have your, like control freaks, right? And, and most of us, we don't think of ourselves as control freaks, but if we're holding on to something in our lives, we're not giving it to God, we're a control freak in that area of our lives, in that area. We've got to relinquish control to areas of my life that are outside of God's will. Acts 16, 7, 8, when they came to the, the border of Maesia, uh, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them, so they passed by. So th- this is just tells what happens is Paul was doing what he's supposed to be doing but he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And so God closed the door and said, you need to be over here. And Paul quickly relinquished control of where he thought he was supposed to be. There's a, there's a rope. You see a picture of a rope. How many of you love ropes? Nobody loves ropes? We have no rope lovers here? This was uh, like, we get a, a knot tying rope in Rangers. Is it knot tying? Those were the two weeks I missed. I never got, a, uh, I never got my badge in Rangers and knot tying. So I'm, I'm seriously thinking about going in and getting my badge because I know how to tie my shoes, thank God. Uh, I don't know how to do a lot of other ties. I'll say, you know how to do a slip knot? Is that when you fall while you're tying something? I don't know. <laughs> the rope, if you're in the water and it's not going well for you, they throw a rope out. You grab a hold of the rope, and they pull you into safety. If you're mountain climbing, I don't know why you would want to, but if you are, and you're stuck where you can't move either hand or either foot, someone will throw you a rope, and you'll grab a hold of it, they'll pull you up. 
Ropes are a good thing. However, on the areas of our life where we're controlling them, we're holding on to that rope. And God is pulling the rope and saying, let go of the rope. Let go of the rope. And we're holding on to the rope saying, I can't. Listen, let go of the rope. Drop the rope. What God has for you is better than what you're holding on to. I promise. Whether you're holding on to your past, you're holding on to your sin, you're holding on to your anxiety, your depression, your addiction, whatever it is you're holding on to, what God has is way better. Trust me on this one. Relinquish control of those areas. When we relinquish the control of the areas of our life that's outside God's will, we relinquish that to God. But here's the thing. It's not a one-time decision. Understand that. That leads us to the next thing. Recommit to a life of submission. When we, when, we, when we relinquish control of an area of our lives, what happens is we give God control of that area. Whatever it is, whether it's sin, whatever it is, we relinquish control, we give it to God, and then what happens? Well, we recommit to a life of submission. It becomes a day, submission then becomes a daily task. It's not something where you relinquish an area of, of God, relinquish that area to God once, and you just say, okay, God, I submit to this, and now I'm done, and you walk away, and everything's fine. That's not how it happens. Because what's going to happen is, as soon as you relinquish control of that, the enemy is going to come in and tell you, you're an idiot, you're stupid. Look at you, now you're a fanatic. You want to be like those crazy Christians. Am I right? Oh, you're going to be like that. Oh, if you, if, you, if you surrender, or your own personal agendas, your own personal uh, uh, affections, your own personal desires are going to jump over God's will, which is why you have to recommit yourselves to submitting to God's will every single day of your life. When you get up in the morning, it's a daily battle. You've got to surrender to God's will and give him your desires every single day. In fact, when you get up in the morning, your prayer should be, God, today, let me do your will, not my will. And that's the last one this morning. Reflect on Jesus' submission for me on the cross. So remembering the blessings of submitting in the past, we're recognizing areas we need to, uh, we need to work on, we relinquish control, we resubmit uh, to, or recommit to submitting to God. And the last one is we reflect on Jesus' submission for me on the cross. Mark 14, 36, Jesus said, Take this cup from me, yet not I will, but my will be done. And there's a picture up here. And while you're looking at the picture, those that are getting baptized are going to go ahead and get up from their seats, are going to walk around, and they're going to walk in those doors. And in a few minutes, you're going to be as excited as I am. Amen? In this picture, there's three possibilities for your life. Three possibilities for life. The first one on the left, well, the, the first circle there represents a person who does not follow Jesus. As you can tell, it's, it's a circle that represents your life. The, the, the chair on it, I know it's a real good picture of a throne. I know we all want nice gold thrones, but we didn't have that today. We just have a chair. The S does not represent stand. No, it represents self. That's you. That's me. And the black circles there, it's all around it represent the different areas of our lives, family, job, whatever it is, whatever you want to say. And then there's the cross of Christ. In this one, this is a secular life. This person's not a Christian. This person, the self is on the chair. The self is the center of the throne. The, the, seraph, it, the self is the centerpiece, and the cross is nowhere in the life. And if you notice, the, the dots just go wherever they want. It's a chaotic life. Some of us remember those days. And it was chaotic. Because if it wasn't chaotic, you would never have seen your need for Jesus. You'd have never come to Christ. So it was very chaotic. And we learned to live in the chaos. But this is, this is when, you're, when your life is it's self-controlled, it's when you're in control. That's the self-control of the sake of, uh, that's the sake of life. The second circle, you see the second circle? A little better. The cross is in part of the life. This represents a Christian, someone who has answered the call, and Jesus said, follow me. They follow Jesus. They're a Christian, but they've not fully submitted their life to him. You say, how is that possible? Yeah, it's absolutely possible. 
It's why we as Christians struggle. It's why the writer of Hebrews says, let us lay aside, let us as believers lay aside the weight of the sin that so easily entangles us. That was a message for believers. We need to lay aside our sin. This isn't people who are just now coming to Christ. These are people that have been believers for a while. He says, let us lay aside the weight of the sin that so easily entangles us. This second one is where Jesus is in your life, but there's an, an area or many areas, and it may, be a, 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 uh, it may be sin, right? It may be sin that you've allowed into your life. It may be, yes, Christians sin. We sin every day, right, for, for the grace of God, and we find forgiveness in his grace. We find forgiveness for our sins. And what happens is, in the second one, it, the life is still chaotic. It's a little better because Jesus is there. We're going to heaven, and some people live their lives like this, they have Christ enough in their lives to get them to heaven. That's not the way to live. It's not a good way to live. And we look at the third circle. Look at the third circle. Third circle represents a person who has put God on the throne where he belongs. And the S is not on the throne. The S has submitted their lives. They put God's will above their own desires. And let me tell you something. The desires that you have, they may be great desires, great intentions, great things you want to do. And you might say, well, I don't want to, if I give my life to Jesus, I don't want to give up my desires. I like the, I, you know, I have plans for this. Listen, God's desires are way better than yours. I promise you that. What I've been through this last year and a half, I promise you that the plans God has for your life are way better than anything you can imagine. And I've been through a lot in the last year and a half. And I can tell you that's true. The third one, life's not chaos. That doesn't mean there aren't chaotic moments. There are chaotic moments. But the life with Christ at the center is lived, there's no chaos because we know that God's in control. That God's either going to, when, when the storm rages, God's either going to calm the storm Calm the child. Matthew 6.33, when you stand this morning, Matthew 6.33, we're going to end this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things be given to you well. Seek first, submit yourselves to God. The sad truth is most of us live in the first or second circle. God wants us in the third circle. So-